notes here. Okay, got it. Let's <laughs> mark that. I guess someone just barely started a recording. Um, so yeah, so that's how this painting came together for me. And I thought it was a real interesting piece to share. Now, okay, I'm gonna move this over because the thumbnails of everybody in our meeting just gets in the way of my being able to see it. I don't know how it is on your screens, but anyway. So this is a spot in the canyon coming down from Scipio uh, into the Severe Valley on the way to my son's house. And I've always wanted to pull over and paint it. And so finally I was able to do so. One time I, I photographed it went to my son's house, started the painting there, but ended up finishing it um, in the studio at home. And I do have a YouTube video on the making of this painting that you could go to YouTube and watch if you would like. This particular painting here was a bugger. Again, I have a YouTube video about it but it was a tough one for me to paint. And uh, this is like the fourth attempt at trying to get it right. I liked the scene when I was there. I really wanted to paint it, but there was so much I had to learn about the painting of it in order to really make it successful that uh, I, I, I got three other clunkers that didn't make it. And this one finally did. What made it hard for you, Tom? What made it hard? Uh, the atmospheric perspective, the, the the atmospheric perspective in the in the scene, and just the patterns, it just felt like it was never quite enough. It felt like too empty and open of a space. And yet, I wanted to be careful about my rendition of the foliage in the foreground, in the middle ground, in the middle distant ground, and then going back into the distance and trying to get the level of detail or lack thereof that I needed uh, was the big challenge for me. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. You bet. And then this one here <clears throat> is, um, this is um, one of my most recent ones. Again, I have a YouTube video about it. This is US Highway 89. Eventually I'll get it framed and have it as part of the round of exhibits that Planner Painters of Utah, we're all, all kind of gearing up for that right now. But this is east of Kanab on your way to Page. These are the Vermilion Cliffs. Not very Vermilion in this early morning light, but still they're the, Ver the Vermilion Cliffs. And so depth of space perspective, learning to trust what I was seeing in terms of the angles and the proportions to really give a sense of the depth of space was a key part of this piece here. And then this painting here is the, uh, is, is, uh, the watercolor that I, um, I employed a lot of lessons from the past with this piece. Now, the main lesson being from Stephen Quiller, using acrylic in such a way that I could paint right over the top of the acrylic with watercolor. The yellow sky and the slight amount of orange, really, in fact, really all the yellow and orange that permeates this whole space, it was laid down first in, um, in, in acrylic. Okay, and uh, what's this, that? Isn't this one you won uh, best of show? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this best is such, in, such a pretty painting. Thank you, and Logan, thank you. Um, do, you do you have to call this a mixed media painting then? You can't call it watercolor, can you? I call it water media. Thank you. Yeah. So I think water media is the most fitting. Um, 
So th when I first laid it down, I was scared of the brilliance of the yellow. It was just way too much and I thought I'd ruined it. But when I started painting the violets and the greens <coughs> of the mountain, and then those middle and foreground fields, things really started to fall into place. Now, this is a place I spent a whole season in cutting uh, barley and oats for farmers, actually mostly barley. All the barley went to Coors Company uh, from that part of Idaho. This is up near Grace. And um, I remember seeing that summer a lot of virga coming down from the sky. And so that's what this right over here is, is a remembrance and a depiction of that. So I used my imagined, an imagination to take this scene from, um, from the dead middle noonday bleached sun, nothing interesting about it, into this evening light um, a situation. And that's what I did to, to bring it to a point of resolution and success. Questions about anything before I move on? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, Go ahead, Vaughn. First of all, when I first saw this, it really popped my eyes out. I, it, it was really stunning when I first saw it. And okay. uh, then you talked about starting out with acrylic. Is that the, it, is it, did you use transparent watercolor <laughs> on the surface? Over and, top of the acrylic? Well, no, when you painted over the acrylic with the watercolor, it was the watercolor transparent because the yellow really does come through. You said you used yellow acrylic, didn't you? Yeah, so a yellow acrylic base, a very thin transparent wash. And if, any, if anybody remembers our lessons from Stephen Quiller when he came, um, to Utah, that's what he taught. And then it's transparent watercolor over the top of the thin wash acrylic, transparent acrylic. And that's what brought this together. So it is all transparent, but it is water media. So the, uh, the brighter uh, yellows and oranges in the foreground, did you add those with watercolor or did you just change the intensity of the acrylic when you put those down? I think I did put watercolor over the top of what yellow was there. I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Beautiful painting. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on. What I wanted to do real quick was share some um, ideas with you that I really kind of help give a global view of art and learning to be a visual artist. And um, I do this because when I teach uh, some workshops and stuff, I or teach classes, I get people who are coming into watercolor a little later in life. And they really haven't gone up through the ranks of art school um, for, in college or, or you know, places like that. So I, I developed this thing I called the art pyramid. And I just gave it a nice graphic flair here in my design and then put in various uh, elements that the artist needs to know and understand. And the foundation of it all is drawing skill. And then there's composition and design, color theory, and then the medium of your choice. Often when someone comes into wanting to learn how to paint with watercolor later in life, they're sort of jumping into the game right here when they need a foundation of these elements down here. And so that's what the rest of the slides are about, showing you that. These questions here that I have X's through, lines through, uh, that's, that's what I share with at some workshops, trying to help give students a guide as to 
the kinds of questions they don't want to ask. They, they shouldn't ask. These are questions that while they're informational, in the end, you have information <clears throat> you can't do much with in terms of learning, improving, and growing your skills as an artist. So I think I'll just go past those because I don't want to take too long my presentation here. But here we have um, the principles and elements of drawing. So I have the list here of gesture drawing, capturing angles, measuring proportions, seeing positive negative space, establishing perspective, then all the, all the elements and properties of light, rendering and shading techniques. Now, perspective and properties of light, well, those beget whole new lists in and of themselves of things to learn. So while this slide gives you the global view, this starts to get into the detail of what an artist needs to learn. And <clears throat> it, learning how to bring it all together takes a real investment of time and practice, and you just have to put in the time and, and practice. <clears throat> Going back to this question here real quick, I sometimes get people who say, what's the one thing I can do to paint better? Or tell me your tricks. Often when I hear that question, or I, I'm, I'm hearing someone say to me, what's the magic? There's no magic here. There's no magic. And if there's any one thing that one should do is always practice, practice, practice. You have to put in the time. It takes work and it takes effort. Any comments about that? Am I out to lunch? You can tell me. Okay. The principles and the elements of design. So over here on the left-hand side of the screen, I have what I teach as the principles of design. And you have to realize that as I'm sharing this with you, this is all kind of the gospel of art, according to me. This is how I teach it. So um, how someone else might teach it. Uh, I'm sure Sherry has some ideas. I'm sure Becky does. I'm sure Mara does. Uh, different ways of teaching principles and ideas. But these are my ideas of design. These are the governing principles, the things that I feel are good to accomplish in a work of art. These over here are the elements, they're the tools the artist has to work with to accomplish good design. Hey, Nia? Yeah? Are you using your iPad? Huh? Are you using your iPad? Is it charged? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we, we, can, we can hear someone talking, I'm not sure. Anyway, okay. So let's move now to color theory. So color theory, understanding primary triad, secondary triad, complementary, analogous, understanding the value of color. In regular art schools and college, we teach these principles and continue on with teaching students drawing principles as they apply to painting. It's just that now we're, we're adding complexity to that by uh, having students learn about color and color theory. And then we come down to being able to take it all and apply it to any medium that you choose to work in, wherever that medium may be. Here in this montage, I've got, uh, I've, I've got watercolors, charcoal, oil, uh, graphite, pen and ink represented. These are the varieties of mediums that I typically work in. And so uh, that's, that's all I got to say about that. Any questions again before I move on? Okay. So I have up here a painting by Stephen Quiller. Why? Because I'm a Stephen Quiller fan. And here we have, uh, this is a recent painting by Stephen. 
it's uh, very much opaque. So I'm thinking this is either gouache or casein, and I'm thinking casein. And uh, he's using the elements of atmospheric perspective in these distant hills here. And then he's playing with all kinds of color combos. We have complementary colors between the orange and the blue. And then down here in the foreground, we have complementary colors in the red and the, and the green. And then with the violet next to any of the green, we're starting to talk about what's called a complementary split relationship of colors. Here we have, I think I'm gonna play a little game with this one here. I'm going to duplicate it. Not like that. I didn't want you to do it like that. No, don't do it like that. Ah, oh, bugger. That's a good one. Oh, it took it right out. I didn't have a chance to. Oh, well, I blew that one. I was going to do something and it didn't work for me. So let me move on to another artist to talk about. Uh, this one's more from history. This is Gunnar Widfross, uh, Scandinavian origin artist. And, uh, you know, he very well may have used a projection device to paint all of these images, but, um, or to draw all of these images. But uh, if he drew them by hand, his drawing skills were mad drawing skills. And his painting skills were pretty impressive as well. So a couple of examples of the, of the uh, artist Gunnar Woodfrost. It's important, I think, to study art history and learn what those who have gone before us have done. So here I have an image by one of my uh, heroes when I was young, John Pike. And he traveled the world and did a lot of paintings. He painted all over the country of Iran back when you, it was a country of peace and you could go there you can enjoy yourself in that beautiful country. Um, but yeah, Gunnar Woodfrost. And then locally, from our history, uh, locally as artists, we have the work of uh, George Dibble. And George is kind of an interesting artist who allowed himself to be influenced by a lot of other artists, and he liked to try new ways of painting images. And, here we have something that's very much influenced by cubism. But also, George Dibble was very much aware of John Marin, a great watercolorist, lousy oil painter, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, his, his oil paintings just got a little muddy to me. But I think that uh, John Marin is a great watercolorist. The symbology in his work, the cubism in his work, is very fun and interesting to see. And uh, yeah, one of my one of my heroes from the past, both well, two of them, George Dibble and uh, John Marin. And then we have another painting by George Dibble here, and uh, this is a very interesting piece. I'm not sure if he necessarily. What it reminds me of is this artist here, Charles Birchfield. Charles Birchfield is very much uh, kind of from, from the tradition of regionalism in American art history. And George Dibble is kind of as well. But um, uh, Charles Birchfield, as he did his watercolors, he was trying to bring a lot of spiritualism into his paintings. And that's why he painted the way he did. To him, there was spiritualism in this. Not religious fervor, but rather spiritualism. And I don't know how to articulate it beyond that. It's kind of beyond my purview what the spiritualism was about at the time. But this is what Birchfield was very much about. 
there's something about Birchfield that I see in George Dibble's work. And so just to give you some ideas and perspective on, on um, the things you need to learn and know and understand about painting, and then just some of my influences, those are the things I wanted to share. I'm dumb. done, done, I'm done. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm uh, Sherry Mydell and uh, do watercolors and uh, children's book illustrations. And uh, I will see if I can share my screen with you. Okay. Eating Crayons by Sherry Mydell. Mom, Mary's bugging me. She just wants to be with you. Mom, I cannot create with Mary staring at me. Give her something to play with. Mom, Mary's eating crayons. Bye bye. Bye bye. To get results, you need the proper artist statement. <laughs> All right. Um, so I do uh, everything from uh, cartoons to uh, real realistic watercolors. And, and so you can kind of tell what's in my brain from uh, that sort of thing. Um, I wanted to talk about um, how to handle a critique without losing your cool. And I've got uh, 10 things here to remember. So it uh, doesn't matter whether you're a writer, illustrator, um, one of the best things that uh, you can do is get some critiques from uh, other artists or somebody that you trust that has an ability to give you good comments on your art. Um, spend more time listening than commenting. Don't spend so much time making excuses that you lose the benefit of the critiquer's comments. And we seem to want to do that when we're um, getting a critique or whenever we show somebody our art, we immediately go, you know, I was sick when I painted this. You can probably tell from, you know, the, the way I did the washes. We immediately want to make excuses uh, when we should maybe just listen to what they have to say. Uh, take notes so you can go over the comments later when uh, your emotions are not so high. Uh, number three, be prepared that the comments might bring up something that you were not aware of and that might be a shock. This always happens with my husband. I show him a painting and I want to know about something and he picks something entirely different to comment on that I have to change in my painting, which is, um, very irritating, but uh, I keep asking him because it's also very good. Be prepared that the comments might bring up something that you were not aware of. Uh, number four, be prepared that the comments might bring up something that you were aware of, but didn't want to address. 
And number five, be prepared for more work and ideas to use on future paintings. Um, I also listen carefully to what the people are saying because sometimes what's bugging them is not what they're commenting on, but I can look at the painting and, and say, if I fix that, that's gonna solve the problem that they're asking about. Number six, do not let the critique discourage you from future painting and creating. Use it as a trampoline to bounce you positively into the next project. Uh, I was teaching a brother and sister, uh, a, some young students. And before the critique, um, I asked uh, the brother, what do you think of your paint? Well, I asked the sister, what do you think of your painting? And she was like, well, this is wrong, that's wrong. Uh, I could have done better on this. And, and the brother said, uh, this is the best thing I've ever done. And so I comment that uh, that way to my art students that uh, this is the best thing you've ever done. So number seven, be prepared that you might not agree with the critique uh, but they might be seeing something that is wrong with your painting that if you take the time to look carefully will lead you to see something that needs to be fixed that might affect what they are seeing and saying. I kind of went over that. Number eight, go over your notes later. Don't just leave them in your sketchbook, but bring them out and go over them. Look at your painting, look at your notes, learn from them. Number nine, Take joy in creating and don't listen to your inner critic that can tell you the negative things about the creative process and your ability. Uh, improvement comes from diving in and continuing to paint and create. Number 10, the most important, because you don't want to end on a number nine when you have a list of things. So uh, one thing that I thought I would do is uh, go over the paintings that made it into Western Fed. And um, so we could take a look at them and, and kind of look at uh, how they look. So this is, um, and Roxanne, um, if, if I forget the name of some of these artists, this is Lester Lee's. Of course. Um, this is his painting. So, um, and I was able to see these paintings, uh, most of them in person, which is, is a really nice thing because you see uh, the quality of the paint and the quality of the wash. But this painting is nicely designed. You can see that big uh, black space on the left and how it moves in under the door and into the window. And then you have that nice shape of the flag coming into that dark spot. And then you have it repeat over on the far right hand side. You've got uh, two black shapes there. Um, just, uh, it kind of grabs you all of a sudden and, and uh, just a really nice painting. Um, this is the one that I did that got in. Uh, this is called Auditory Perception. So I had two paintings that I entered and it was interesting. Mary White was the judge. It was interesting to see that she chose this one instead of the other one. Um, and it might be that uh, this one told more of a story. Um, and, and again, it's kind of got some... Uh, bold darks and, and lights in the painting. This is uh, Jenna Parkins. Um, there's a real feeling in this painting. Um, the washes are done very nicely. Uh, they don't look like individual shapes. They look like part of a painting. And, and once again, there's a lot of emotion in this painting, a lot of darks and lights. Um, and I don't know if that's what grabbed the um, juror's eyes or not. 
this is uh, Brady Crops. He entered two. I'm not sure which one made it in, um, but I think it was this one. Uh, same thing with some nice darks and, and lights. And, and look at the division of the line where the division of the grass is. And then you have the division of the brown behind the aspen trees. And then the yellow behind that, uh, just nicely designed. Although, you know, you've got one aspen in the middle and then two on either side. So there's rules in uh, composition, um, but those rules, um, if you make a good painting, you can um, ignore the rules or use them to your advantage. Uh, this painting uh, glowed. This was by Morgan. Oh, um, I can't think of her last name. Um, uh, Morgan McHugh. Morgan McHugh. Morgan McHugh. Morgan McHugh. And I looked at this painting. It just shimmered. And if you look at it, look at, um, so zoom in on, look at those. Those are just random shapes that are so interesting. Um, but when you put them together in the entire painting, it just makes a very nice uh, composition. Look at the line where the horizon is, uh, that dark horizon where the trees are. And then um, just that uh, one sheep on the, the left that's kind of in the foreground, right above that dark shape. Um, so you've got one over there and then you've got three clumped together and one in the back, um, just very nicely designed. And once again, uh, really grabs your attention with the lights and the darks. And I'm not sure how she got uh, uh, so much of a glow out of her painting, but a uh, very nice painting. This is Roxanne Fisters. This is a bold statement. Um, this is such a bold statement of, of this gentleman, you know? So you look at him and you see his personality. His face is right there in the uh, third part of the painting. And then look at his shoulders, how they're angled and how that angle in this painting gives movement. And once again, there's a mood and uh, to this painting and, and some uh, darks and lights. And look at, look at those eyes. Both of them are different and um, really add to the painting. This one is Ian Ramsey's. This uh, very nice, solid, beautiful painting. Um, so once again, it looks like you've got a telephone pole that's coming up right in the middle of the painting and, and you're not supposed to put uh, something right in the middle of the painting. It's a little to the, to the right of center, but with the two telephone poles, um, it kind of uh, frames that beautiful road entry back into the background. And it just frames that area. And that's where your eye goes and where it looks at. I also want you to look at how he's done the people. So these people in the background are just shapes, you know, but we um, look at shapes and we see people. If we end up trying to put too much detail into those little shapes, then we start to lose um, what they say. Um, but he's done an amazing job. Uh, and a lot of fun detail. Look at the detail in the side of that building. Uh, you can just feel the different textures in this painting. And, um, okay, oh, let's see. Um, I think this is Robert Chamberlain. I think this painting got in totally because of good design. You've got that angle of, of the edge of the hilltop there. Um, 
you've got the figures and the sheep, a group of sheep, and then two in the foreground, and you've got that nice road coming down. Um, he's got a person that has no detail. And then he's got the three light spots up in the sky. So I think uh, this painting was a bold statement and, um, and very nicely designed also. So I think uh, design has a lot to do with uh, um, how your painting is perceived and um, gives it a lot of strength that you may not even recognize but really adds to the look of a painting. So um, we can go on and uh, do some critiques now, if you want. Um, Tom, do you want me to just put these on screen since? Uh... Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we have two here by Dewey. And uh, so, do you have any comments, Tom? <clears throat> um, so as I'm looking at the scene, um, the the kind of light that I'm seeing here seems to be a very diffused light. Uh, maybe that was. Maybe that's the way it was. I don't know. Um, but I, I think perhaps some more drama in the lighting situation of these uh, southern Utah uh, forms might be might might give them a little more uh, strength. The values throughout the shadow areas of the um, uh, of the forms. Uh, they're all pretty much the same. Could some be slightly darker than others? And uh, uh, on your figures, Dewey, I would say, uh, take a note from the things that have been shared so far and just keep practicing them. I think what you have is a good start in terms of, of um, skill development, but just keep practicing with that, uh, with uh, drawing those small figures like that. And don't worry so much about um, a likeness of anybody, especially at that distance. That's what I would say. And, and the same thing on this also. <clears throat> I'd like to say something about Dewey's paintings. Uh, I, I've watched his paintings. Um, and and there's a uh can't see the paintings anymore uh okay let's see if uh we can figure out what's going on here it said the uh sharing had stopped for some reason oh. so can you still hear me we can hear you but yeah the sharing stopped huh And it's not uh, letting me share anymore. Shall I? Do um, that? I yeah. Can share screen real quick. And we've got some extra paintings that were emailed me after I sent you the ones that I sent to you. Okay. So Which one would you like me to pull up? Just uh, we can start with the, the second one of Dewey. I just want to tell Dewey that his paintings have really improved as I've watched him. Um, his wash quality has improved and um, I see great improvement in his paintings. So just keep it up. It's a nice sky in this particular painting. I like the sky. Yeah, it's very nice. Would you like me to call up the next one? Yeah. Okay. Need to enlarge it here. Okay, let me see if I can find out 
<coughs> whose this is. <coughs> I speak up. It's Art. Oh, Art. Okay. How you doing, Art? Pretty good, Thank Tom. You. Good. So uh, I think this, the wash in the sky is really nice. Um, <clears throat> There might be a little bit of too much of a hard edge on some of those uh, where the light's shining through down below. <clears throat> and in the dark ripples uh, down below, it, it, they might be a little too similar. Um, we have a tendency to think of things like uh, if we do fence posts, we make all those fence posts the same. And Sorry, I'm calling the image up here. Okay, and some of those uh, some of those ripples in the water um, look very similar. But I like the division of uh, the water against the sky. That's a good division. Those are my comments. I'm trying Beautiful to get a wash in the sky. Oops, come on. Okay, I was trying to rearrange my screen so that I could maybe digitally draw on it here for you, uh, just to kind of illustrate some points. Uh, first of all, um, I, you know, I don't know. I like to try and make my horizons, especially with the body of water, just as straight as I can. Um, some people tilt their horizons quite a bit. And that's, uh, I, I, I always find myself wanting to straighten the picture <laughs> a little bit. But uh, another thing, uh, the sky is very beautifully done. As we have these rays of light coming through here, 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 and here, they're very rhythmical and they're very similar in size. I would suggest letting one ray of light really break through big. Maybe not have one here and maybe have another one breaking off pretty big over here. And I think it would help with the uh, with with the way those rays of sun coming through the sky. They I think they would add drama, and it would definitely become your your focal point, mm -hmm. and it would um, add a great deal of visual interest to those rays coming out. That's what comes to my mind as I'm looking at it. Any thoughts from you, Art, on what we've shared? You, you un unmuted me. No, I appreciate the comments. I was looking at that and seeing that they were, as you were talking, seeing what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And all, I also don't have, if, if that, those lights are coming from a, the source of sun, uh, maybe the sun's in the wrong place. I don't know. <laughs> Um, it's hard to say. I mean, not necessarily because yeah. light can do crazy stuff. Yeah. So it's glowing up as well as the rays down. No, I appreciate the comments. No problem. Shall I move on, Sherry? Yeah. One thing I'll do with the edge of a, a water a ocean is put just a strip of tape over. Yeah. Uh, to get a straight edge and just take my square brush and get that uh, edge of that ocean and, and come down with it. And before I paint anything else, if I want to get that edge really straight. Makes sense. And in doing that, I would suggest that actually our, what you have here on this edge of the ocean between ocean and sky 
is a very soft edge. It's not a really hard edge. And that's a good thing. The only thing that I guess we're feeding, feeding on here is the need to want to straighten it. Mm. And okay. uh, yeah, so I think your edge there between water and sky is beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Yep. Okay. Let me call up. Let's see. Let's look at this one. It's like they're siblings. <laughs> this is called uh, Fair Friends, F-A-I-R. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and it was by um looks like Yvonne Krauss. I think that was the name. Yep, Yvonne Krauss. So very nice rendition of the two uh, Herefords. Nice placement of where their heads meet. I was wondering if, if maybe the blue underneath their noses, if that had been grayed down a little, if it would have uh, changed uh, the fill of the painting a little. Instead of having it so blue, have it a grayed blue. It would still be a complement of the kind of the orange of the cow, but I wondered if that would uh, make it stand out a little more. It's an interesting comment, yeah. But it's a bold statement, you know. I like the feel of the textures back here in this uh, in this brick background. I love the kind of emotion that's there too. I mean, this is like these are bovine emotions. They're comforting each other in a stressful situation for themselves, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm trying to just illustrate um, putting a little bit of light and putting a little bit of shade uh, into um, that. Those, um, yeah, let's bring this down like this. And hopefully by doing that, you can see that maybe adding just a little more shade to that might help give a sense of the three dimensionality and uh, of the of those halters that the cows are wearing. Um, that's all I really have to say. Okay, and, and what uh, what uh, are you using um, to put those marks oh. on the photo? I'm using paint canvas. Okay. It's it's the most dumbed down user friendly <laughs> version of Photoshop. And okay. I love it. I use it for everything. And it's called paint. Paint canvas. It's uh, it's it's uh, Apple's version of Microsoft Paint. Okay. Yeah. Shall I bring up the next one? Uh, yep. Okay. We won't save that. <clears throat> Was this done on UPO? 
Um, let's see who did that. Yes, it's you, Paul. Okay. And, and tell us your name. I'm Diane AC. Diane, okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, I kind of played around with this on uh, Procreate. Um, there was so much texture. Uh, and I went in and, and really made this foreground uh, as dark as the darkest shadow on these cliffs. And when I did that, the sky just popped out. Um, so you darkened this foreground through here? I, I darkened the whole entire cliff. Wow. Well, cliff area. So um, let's try that real quick here. So you came in like, like that? Yeah, and up above too. And right that little triangle there. And um, it wouldn't have to be that dark, but what it does is it, it causes the foreground and the sky to quit fighting against each other. Um, and it really, makes that sky pop. I don't know if there's any way you could do that with UPO. Um, it may not be the effect that you're trying to get, um, but I was just surprised at what doing that did to the sky. Yeah, that really does bring that sky out. But I don't know how you could do that with a UPO. I've not been able to use UPO for uh, regular uh, uh, representational painting such as this is doing. I mean, it's, it's gutsy of you to use this paper to paint the way you are. I can't do it. <laughs> I have to use it in a very much more abstract manner. In fact, uh, in the paintings I have made on UPO paper, have actually gone totally abstract. And I have um, I have actually gotten very physical with the thickness of the paint on UPO as well. I'm not sure how well it really adheres over the long term, but it's what I've done to feel like I could be successful with using UPO. Otherwise, it uh, trying to do regular paintings on it like this, it kind of kicks me around the room. So way to go. <laughs> yeah, way to go indeed. I've never uh, painted on you, Paul. Well, it is harder to do glazes because what it does is picks up the paint underneath rather than just lays it down. Yuko yeah. was originally developed by the Japanese as a way to help the uh, paper industry stop using so much paper. It's a polyura, polyurethane type. Anyway, it's a type of plastic, but um, they can print on it, and it's what uh, covers uh, uh, pill bottles. And of course, it's very, very thin. What they sell to us as artists is physically much thicker paper. And last I heard, the jury is still out on the longevity of this kind of paper and for archivalness. You know, people say it could last, it should last, but nobody really knows yet. Maybe the paint will just peel off of it. Could happen if it's not sealed and not yeah. held perfectly still, that, that could happen, especially if you went as thick as I did. You can so <laughs> easily go thick on, on this UPO paper with, you can start using it watercolor like it's like it's oil paint. It's well, you, can, you also can put a varnish on it. Varnish would help, yeah. Anything else before I, I close this one out? 
I don't have anything else. Okay. Got one last one to pull out. Okay, and then uh, I've got a few to share again. I'll try to share my screen. Okay. Here we go. Let me see if I can, if uh, the person who did this painting is online, tell us your name. Lael. Lael Holm. Okay, hi, Lael. Hi. Okay, I'm going to try something, Lael. Kind of similar to actually what we did with the uh, Yupo painting. I don't know, I might be out to lunch, but. But the idea behind this is to kind of calm down what's down below here so that it's a darker value. And then it would help the symbolism of the steer skull to stand out even that much more. You know, I put so many glazes on those hills. Um, but yeah. <laughs> <I get it. laughs> yeah. Well, that's my thought initially as, look, as I'm looking at it. Um, I, I liked what that did to the painting. Yeah. It really threw your eye up into the skull. It yeah, I like that. And you know, it's, I might have missed that, Sherry, if you hadn't shared what you shared about uh, the earlier painting. I just looked at this and said, I think it could help this one too. Yeah. It's interesting how just changing the values a little can just uh, make a painting uh, sing. So this painting is nicely done. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the feather is nicely done. The skull is nicely done. The sky is. But uh, when you made that value a little darker down there, uh, it just popped. Sometimes it's really hard to get a good, deep, rich value um, mm -hmm. in watercolor. A lot of times we're afraid uh, to just put the color down. Um, so, uh, but it would have to be a darker glaze than you put in pudding. Yeah, I just didn't want it to get muddy. Yeah. Well, that's where perhaps um, laying down, trying to get as close to the correct value that you want with the first wash yeah. might help you to keep it from getting muddy. Um, but you know, what I would do with this is I would say, I'm going to try and learn something here and maybe take a little risk and go for it yeah. and then risk messing it up. <laughs> and, which uh, is so think, scary. <laughs> what's that? Uh, which is so scary, you know, when you've got a nice painting. Um, it is. Part of getting a, moving your painting from very nice to wow is is going for it you know yeah that's very true this feather will definitely stand out a lot more against these mountains in the distance if they're darkened another thing i would consider also again is trying to this sort of has a photographic light and shade pattern to it as opposed to actually being in light mm -hmm. i mean yeah you know, i can in my thumbnail i could move my face up to my light and you can see the light and you can see the dark mm -hmm. and i feel like a little more of that in the skull would help it as well okay very nice painting yeah okay. thank you for the comments i appreciate it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you ready to uh, take over then? Shall I give you the screen back, Sherry? Uh, yeah, I'll uh, see if I can. Uh, for some reason, my video stopped too. So, okay, screen start.
There we go. Okay. And I'll go back here. Okay. Can you guys see the paintings now? The pink haired lady? The pink haired lady. Yeah. This is Brenda Brunello's. Um, <laughs> see ya. Brenda? <laughs> I, I popped up this painting and it just made me smile. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, and, and the placement of the figure, I think, is very nicely done. We know where she's at. Um, we know her personality. Um, I, I think uh, some of the washes could be um, a little different quality, you know? I like this dark, dark here to the left. Um, I think that really, really stands out nice. And um, the detail of the bracelets and everything. Um, I wonder if you want to go in and just do a little more detail. Okay. Um, what, what did you say? Okay. Oh, you didn't tell me to go take a hike? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Um, okay. And, and I don't have uh, a little uh, pencil on my thing to kind of uh, show you what I mean. But, you know, just a, a few details, like the back of the ear um that's a hard line there do you want a straight hard line on that lower lobe or do you want to soften it somewhere that would make you, sense and and do you want more shadow under the chin and and the neck and do you want a little bit of variety of color in the face um sometimes uh we can put a lot of color in a face and, and it uh, adds to the painting and the quality of the painting and adds a little variety to the face. So I would think about those things. Do you have some comments, Tom? Well, this blue, this greenish blue, uh, these greenish blue elements of the background of the bus, um, you know, behind her. Uh, I think it's a great compliment to the pinks. I think they work beautifully. Um, yeah, I love the kind of character study that it is. I, I really do. Um, yeah, that's all I got to say. Okay, fun painting, Brenda. Very fun. <laughs> I loved it. Okay, let's see, whose is this? Um, it's right down there. Uh, Suzanne. Reynolds. Reynolds, Suzanne Reynolds. So do you have comments on this one, Tom? Um, so, I really like the going from shadow in the foreground into bringing the light up on the mountain here. And I think if you do anything, maybe you could actually do a little bit more of that, darken it even more in the foreground. And um, uh, the treatment in here of the, I'm sorry, I'm working with my cursor. I realize you don't see my screen. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the, um, the 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 winter foliage of the bare branches in the middle ground there in the middle distant ground next to that blue green tree, I like the feel of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. just uh, very nice. Yeah, same thing back behind the aspens. You yes, know? that's true. That area back there is very nice. 
It looks like water too, you know? It does. Um, nice painting. That's all I have to say about that one. Yeah. Just my little comment about maybe actually darkening the foreground is really all I would say, maybe. Okay. And that would maybe do the same thing that those other two paintings did, you know? Yeah, I got a, kind of got on a kick there, didn't I? Yeah, it was a good kick. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, I think this is Julie Ickes. Julie Ickes? Right? Ickes? I yeah, always call her the wrong name. Yes, but it's, it's Julie Rickey now. I got married. Yeah, well, that's right. Ed can pronounce that right. <laughs> um, okay, Julie. Um, I love the way the light looks like it's coming through that canyon and hitting that back wall. That's fun. Um, I, I think that the texture on this left cliff here is kind of competing again um, with all the other texture in the painting. Um, and I think part of this water looks like, the, the water in the background looks like it's tilted a little. Instead of having the rocks going uh, horizontally, the ones in the water look like they're just tilted enough that it, um, might be looking like it's uh, the whole water is tilted. The perspective might be a little off. Is this a side, scan a side canyon with the stream flowing out of it or is it? Yes. Okay. And the color is a lot more saturated than it's showing up on my computer here. It's oh, okay. I was worried that I maybe had my colors too saturated because it it's way brighter than this one. Huh. Um, photography also always affects the way our paintings look. That's for sure. I, I like the, I get it right. I like the reflection uh, of the cliff down in the water. That's nice. Yeah. For my for 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 my uh, part, Julie. Um, the the cool and darker colors are pretty close to being just as intense in chromatic intensity as the warmer colors are. And as a result, they start to compete chromatically with the warm colors. I would consider actually graying those cooler colors out a bit and uh, seeing if that kind of helps your, uh, your, your warm colors of your canyon a bit more. And uh, the values look very similar, you know? I, I wanna see a little bit of more variety with the, the values in some places. Yeah, it would have been nice to, uh, I, that's, that's what I could have done on my computer. That's what I was trying to do earlier in my presentation is take the copy and turn it into a black and white so you could see the color and the value relationships. It's important to learn how to see color as value as much as seeing color as color itself. I wish you could see the originals because that mountain on the left is like way dark way darker than you can hear, but. Oh okay. yeah, there we go. So this is uh, black and white. And uh, so anyway, the way the, the photograph of the painting turned out, it's, uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see the original painting. So, all right. Julie, are you living in California now? No, I'm in St. George. St. George. Mm -hmm. Is there snow down there in St. George? No, not, not any. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. sorry. <laughs> right. 
-hmm. I'm going to bad mouth your painting a little more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very nice. I, I love that it looks like light coming in and hitting that back wall of the canyon. That's very nicely done. Yeah, it does. Any more comments, Tom? I think that's uh, pretty well it for me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That, that is the last one. So are um, we dumb? We I mean, are. <laughs> we, we are. Okay, let's see if I can get back to Zoom here. And okay. There we are. Does anybody else have any comments they'd like to throw out? I think that's been a great presentation. Thanks, you guys. Well, Thank you thanks, Roxanne. I was wondering if Becky had fallen asleep. <laughs> No, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, well, Becky, okay. Well, I think that's all we have. Well, those were great comments. I, I thought everything you said so much made sense. Thank you very you much. Know, uh, people often get upset. They ask her for a critique, and then they get upset if you critique it. And I think. Um, Sherry's points about you know taking a critique for what it's worth you if you ask for a critique it's important to listen and uh, there were some really good points I think that you guys made that I hadn't thought of that darkening that's really fun the way you darken that and uh, tells you immediately so yeah good ideas good ideas thank you very much I thought I saw Leal raising her hand. I'm, I think she's going to ask a question. I, I was looking at the thumbnails. Maybe she is waving goodbye. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Julie's probably going to go take a walk outside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does, everyone, does everyone mind if I share one more thing uh, from my screen? Would that be okay if I did that real quick? Sure. Okay. Um, I just, it just, your, your uh, piece reminded me, Julie, of something that um let's see ah here we go what's opening i didn't hit anything no 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 don't want to do that So this is a studio version of this painting. And you can see the colors that I was painting there, Julie. I don't know if that serves to help anything there. Let me call up the plein air piece that I did on location. Okay. So that gives us an idea of uh, what... Uh, in terms of the coloration. Does that give you any ideas, Julie? Okay, well, anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you real quick, just to try and add to the conversation. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Tom. Mm -hmm. I'm done also. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah. Hopefully, in May, it won't be snowing. <laughs> <laughs>
Just okay. have your hip boots. I wouldn't though. count on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know either, but I'm going to have my fingers crossed. If not, I'm going to Texas anyway with the uh, <laughs> uh, to see the Western Fed show. So, all right, maybe it'll switch and be snowing down there. Okay, thanks everybody. I'll close out. Okay. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Everybody, remember.